All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. And the Apostle Paul says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or counting their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul speaks here in eloquent language about the heart of the gospel message and about the call that we have to share the gospel. And I want to share with you this morning on this topic, ambassadors for Christ, ambassadors for Christ. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us as we look into God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the beautiful name of Jesus, the name that opens heaven's door to us, and we thank you for the gift of your word. It is a lamp for our feet, and it is the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we pray that over this next time, Lord, our hearts might be good soil, soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus, you said that the words you speak to us are spirit, and they are life. So, Holy Spirit, come now, please and minister life to us from the scriptures. If you agree with that, say amen. amen and amen. Well, last week, Pastor Glenn shared a great word from 2 Corinthians 4 on not losing heart when you're falling apart. How does he come up with those things? I don't know. And I strongly encourage you to catch that message if you missed it. Pastor shared on why we suffer affliction, and he said that affliction comes so that we can experience God's glory. And we also saw Paul reminding us that we are called to look at things which are eternal, not at things which are temporary. Moving into chapter 5 now, Paul is encouraging us to stay on track by focusing on the things that truly matter in life. This chapter contains some of the most compelling writing in all of Paul's letters, and he pushes us to think about what's really worth spending our lives upon. He says that one day we will be clothed with immortality and glory. Does that sound good to anybody? Amen. He says, though, that while we wait for that day, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. And he calls us also to remember that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul also teaches us in chapter 5 that focusing on what is eternal means that we can no longer judge people by what is external. If we are in Christ, then we need to view our fellow man differently. We can no longer know people according to the flesh. We need to know them according to the Spirit. We need to look at saints and sinners alike through the lens of Christ. Is somebody a Christian? If so, then I need to view him generously, view him as a brother, view him as a work in progress. I need to see him as somebody for whom God has planned good things. If a man is outside of Christ, then I need to view him with eyes of mercy. Yes, it's true. He's in spiritual danger, but he's also a good candidate to become a part of the family of God. If we recall how we received God's mercy when we certainly didn't deserve it, then it will be easier to remember that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now in our text today, Paul is pushing us to think about eternity by telling us, incredibly, that we, that you and I, have become an indispensable part of the plan of God. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them, you're kind of important. (laughs) 
How many of you have neighbors that said, no, I'm really important? All right. All right, one hand, all right. So we're mostly humble, praise God. Now, it may sound exaggerated to say that mere mortals can be so important to God's purposes, but you and I are actually indispensable to the story that God is writing. We're an essential factor in a drama that touches every life in this world. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. And here in chapter 5, I see the Holy Spirit calling us to think about the part that you and I are playing in the drama of salvation. I see here three critical questions of life that every one of us needs to answer. How many of you want to be ambassadors for Christ this morning? Amen. If you want to serve Jesus faithfully and hear him say, well done, then I want to share with you these three great pressing questions of life. Three burning questions in 2 Corinthians. Corinthians 5, and the first one is this, what is my greatest need in life? What is my greatest need in life? The Bible has the answer. Our greatest need in life is to be reconciled to God. The gospel message is good news. One beautiful summer day, maybe a little not bit cooler than today's going to be, but one beautiful summer day, a pastor was busy working on his sermon when one of his deacons burst through the door and said, Pastor, I have good news and I have bad news. The pastor said, all right, I'll bite. What's the good news? And the deacon said, praise God, the women's softball team finally won a game. And the pastor said, that's great news. What's the bad news? And the deacon said, they beat the men. <laughs> Now that was mixed news, right? But the gospel is good news. It's all good news. In verse 18, Paul says, God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. He describes the purpose of Jesus' cross in verse 19, saying that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's why God sent Jesus into the world. The cross was not a mistake. It was not something that caught God by surprise. The cross was not just the greatest example of sacrificial love. No, the cross was God acting in history to reconcile us to himself. Reconciliation is a word that most of us know. It speaks of situations where people are at odds with one another and they need to restore their relationship if they can. Married couples in crisis may try to reconcile. Warring ethnic groups sometimes have ceremonies where they announce that they are reconciling and they're putting aside their old hatreds. And maybe you've sat up late on an occasion, a time or two, with a pile of receipts trying to reconcile your checking account because we don't always agree with the bank about exactly how much money we have. <laughs> After all, how can I possibly be overdrawn if I still have some checks left? <laughs> The Greek word for reconciliation is fun to say. It's katalasso. Katalasso. Katalasso simply means to exchange one thing for another. It was a word that was used in court in the ancient world when disputing parties were reconciled together again. It means that two people have exchanged something. What have they exchanged? They have traded, it means, hostility for friendship. And Paul uses this word to talk about what happens when we come home to God. See, pagan peoples like the Greeks and the Romans, they believed that the gods needed to be convinced to help mankind. But Jewish people knew that the truth was actually quite the opposite. It was actually mankind who had separated himself from a loving God by sin and disobedience. And I believe the Holy Spirit is calling us to recover in our time our focus on that burning issue. Church, people may not always be clear about it, but the gospel is not a mystery. 
The word of God has never been unclear about our greatest need. There have been some seasons in time, even maybe entire centuries, when the church was uncertain about the gospel, but God has never left us in doubt about what the gospel is and what it requires of men and women. And the gospel is good news because it addresses my greatest need. Man's greatest need is not for self-improvement. It's not to eliminate poverty or to get an education. Our greatest need is not to leave this world a better place than the way we found it. None of those things will solve my most pressing need, which is to be reconciled to God. Amen. Jesus addressed this issue in a much more in-your-face way than we usually do it today. Jesus said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Jesus is telling us here that no matter what I achieve, what titles or accolades I win, if I gain the whole world and yet still lose my soul at the end of the day, it will all have been for nothing. Our greatest need is to receive the benefit of Jesus' sacrifice so that we can be reconciled to God. What a tremendous urgency that Jesus himself placed upon that need. In church, I'm afraid it's an urgency that we have sometimes failed to feel. Perhaps the most famous verse in all of scripture you know is John 3.16, which of course begins, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But in our amazement at his amazing grace, I think we often miss the potential sentence of death that's contained in the latter part of that verse because it goes on to say that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. If I could be colloquial about it this morning, I would say it like this. Of all the men who've ever walked upon the face of the earth, only Jesus died and lived to tell about it. <laughs> Therefore, And because that's the case, we as Christians need to take heed to what Jesus said about eternal things and feel the weight of his words. Forget the faithless philosophies of those who deny Christ and deny his word. Jesus alone has a clear view, has a complete view of the realities of eternity, the realities of heaven and of hell. John Lennon sang it, imagine there is no heaven. Well, you can imagine it all you want. But Jesus Christ said there is a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid. And I'm going with Jesus and what Jesus said. <laughs> Only Jesus is qualified to talk to us about the blessing that awaits the people of God. And only Jesus is qualified to tell us about what awaits those who refuse his gospel. Sin is what separated our first parents from God. And sin is what still makes us a stranger to him as well nowadays. And so wide was this grand canyon of sin between man and God that it would take the death of his only son to make a bridge across it. Thanks be to God. His love made a way for us to return to the Father's house. And Paul says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. Amen. Amazing grace that Jesus would carry my sorrow so that by his stripes I might be healed. Amen. But what if I refuse his forgiveness? Perhaps you're here this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. The word of God is clear. Our sins have placed us in a state of war, a state of hostility against God. And I know that in today's society, sin is just considered a, a bad joke. But God's holiness has never changed. And neither has human nature. We are separated from God and we can only come home to him by the way that he has appointed. Jesus said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father except through me. Amen. God's offer is clear. 
We can accept his offer of forgiveness through Jesus Christ who suffered for us or else we are free to pay the penalty ourselves. You've probably heard this example, but suppose we were in court, charged with a terrible crime and about to be sentenced. Now imagine if the judge were to say, you can either pay this penalty yourself, or if you'd like, you can agree to let me take that punishment for you. That would be amazing love. That would be insane. That would be unheard of. And yet that is what Jesus has done for you and for me. What if we refuse his offer? If we do, then only judgment can await us. Church, the gospel is good news. In fact, it's the best news. But the reason why it's such good news is because we're in such a bad news situation when it comes to our relationship with God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death and eternity without him. And you know, not long after that famous John 3.16 comes John 3.18, which people don't like to read very much. And it says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And friends, because we face such grave spiritual danger, our greatest need in life is that we might be reconciled to God. Church, we live in an urgent hour, and the Holy Spirit, I believe, is asking us to focus once again on the fact that this is the greatest need of man. What is my greatest need? That I might be reconciled to God. Three burning questions in 2 Corinthians 5. If my greatest pressing need is to be reconciled to God, then the second urgent question I need to grapple with to ask and answer is this. Have I been reconciled to God? Have I been reconciled to God? Now, I may believe in God and in the Bible. I may even agree with you when you say that Jesus died for my sins. But none of that is the same as trusting Christ to save me. Simply knowing that I have a need will never meet my need. Being hungry does not cause food to appear on your kitchen table. I need to turn away from sin and turn towards Jesus Christ. And when I do that, Paul says, I will become a new creation. It's a change so radical that Jesus described it as being born again. The new birth is not a doctrine. It's not a philosophy. It's an experience. It's God giving you new life. And if you've ever watched a baby being born, you know that reading about it and being there are two different things. And all the moms said? And Jesus said, unless you are born Again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So the question is whether you've ever truly been born again by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul did not say, well, Jesus died on the cross and therefore everyone will be saved. No, Paul said, if. Everybody say if. If. Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And that's a big if. The good news of the gospel is that Christ is willing to save you. But you know what we hear many times as as pastors, and maybe you've heard it as well a time or two, is that some people tell us, I am afraid I've gone too far for God. God will not receive me because of the things that I've done. Listen, God's spirit is able to change your desires and able to break the habits that are making you ashamed and unable to look people in the eye. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul said, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Praise God. 
Look at the grace of God that's in that passage. Paul says, such were some of you. If God can transform the people on a list like that, then I can assure you that you haven't gone too far for God's power to rescue you today. And right here at Harvest Time, we've seen Jesus Christ set people free from every kind of sin. Right here in this church, Jesus has made the drunk a sober man. He's made the drug addict clean. Jesus has given the porn addict a pure heart. He's taken the burden of guilt from the shoulders of those who've shed innocent blood. He's changed the thief into an honest man. Jesus has saved our marriages, restored our families. He's healed our bodies. He's given us hope. He's turned our weeping into laughter, and he's turned our mourning into dancing. Praise God. Jesus can make you a new creation so that you too will be able to look back and say, old things have passed away and look, all things have become new. Amen. Now we saw how Paul says God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God. And church, that's telling me that we will not only be pardoned, but we will be welcomed by God. To go back to our little example of the courtroom, you know, a pardon only cancels your punishment. You're still a criminal, but you've only been pardoned from punishment. But if you're in Christ, you've been made the righteousness of God, and that's something much better. It means that you have good standing with God. It means that you no longer need to be ashamed when you look God in the eye. It means that the judge has not only pardoned you, he took you home with him. He sat you at his table. He adopted you. He gave you his name. He put you in his will. He made you sons and daughters of the living God. And the Bible says you're accepted in Christ. I have a word for somebody today. Maybe people have not always accepted you. But God says, I will welcome you and you will be sons and daughters to me. Paul says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. What a change. Some of you here, you think that you've just been stumbling through life, that your life has been a series of random calamities. But if you're in Christ, God promises to lead you with his voice and with his hand. The Bible says that he causes all things to work together for good to those who are the called ones, the ones who love him. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his path. Isn't it good to know that if you're in Christ, that God is starting to order all things for your good. There's another group of people who often think that they need to do something to make God receive them, to make God love them. But that work has already been done. Paul says that great work of reconciliation was the work of God. From start to finish, it was God's plan and it was God's work. And there's nothing that we can add to it, nor do we need to add to it. The great English preacher Charles Spurgeon said, When Jesus hung upon the cross, when Jesus died, when Jesus rose again, everything was done that was necessary in order for God to be able to forgive the guilty and receive them to his bosom. Nothing can be added to Christ's completed work of which he said, it is finished. We read in Ephesians 2 that salvation is a gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation isn't something to be earned. It is a gift to be received. And maybe somebody needs to hear this this morning. We do not do good works in order to be saved. We do them because we are saved. But despite Jesus' offer, there's another, another group of people who are too ready to delay. There are so many things in life we think that we want to do or we need to do first before we'll give our lives to God. Church, let me warn you, we can never be sure of another tomorrow. But yet here is Jesus offering us pardon today. 
Can you feel the urgency in Paul's voice? Really, it's the voice of the Holy Spirit when he says, look, now is the accepted time. Look, now is the day of salvation. Jesus said in Revelation 3, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Will you let him in today? I pray that you will. It's the greatest question that we each need to answer for ourselves. Have you been reconciled to God? This brings us to the third final burning question we could find in 2 Corinthians 5. My greatest need is to be reconciled to God. And that causes me to ask whether I've been reconciled to him. But Christians need to ask themselves a third question. And it's this. What is my greatest mission? What is my greatest mission? We may have different callings, but I believe there's one great mission that every Christian shares. Our greatest mission is to see people reconciled to God. That is the mission of every believer in Christ. We call it the Great Commission. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Paul says we have all received. Everybody say all. All. The ministry of reconciliation. Now I do believe in seeking God about what is his will for my life. What is his plan for my life. But church, notice what Paul says in verse 18. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now within that passage, Paul is explaining to us what it is. He is explaining the ministry of reconciliation. And we need to understand this uh, before we go today. So let's break it down quickly. The first thing we need to know and understand about the ministry of reconciliation is this. We need to remember the content of the message. What is the message of reconciliation? Now, I don't know if you noticed it as we went through the passage before, but Paul is giving us an outline of the gospel, of the message of reconciliation. First, he says, God was in Christ. That's the plan of the cross in the mind of God. Tell people that God loves them, that he made a plan to save them, that saving them was his idea, and that it's his work, not their work. Next, he says that God was reconciling the world to himself. That's the purpose of the cross. Tell them that God sent his son, why? To die for us so that we might not perish. Then Paul says that God was not imputing or not counting their trespasses to them. That's the pardon that's in the cross. Tell them that Jesus has made a way for us to receive pardon from God. Tell them that God's throne of judgment can become a throne of mercy. A lot of people say, only God can judge me. Well, fine, but I don't think you want to go there. <laughs> Tell people that his throne of judgment can become a throne of mercy if they will only accept his offer. When you're a Christian, that's not a judgment throne. The Bible says, let's come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. Finally, it says, Paul says, that he has given us the message of reconciliation. And that's the preaching of the cross. Part of the message is that you've been given the message. Isn't that interesting? We're called to tell people about what Jesus has done for us. We also ought to tell them, I think that we're just like them. I think this is part of what Paul's getting at. That all of us have come to Jesus the same way, as sinners in need of a Savior. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you've committed sins. And so have I. We are not better than you. It's a simple message, the gospel. A five-year-old can grasp it enough to begin to walk in relationship with God. And sometimes I think that we as Christians need to remind ourselves of the simplicity of sharing Jesus. One old preacher said it like this, evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Just go and tell somebody this week that you've been sent to them with God's message of reconciliation. So we need to remember the content of the message. Second thing we need to know about the ministry of reconciliation is this. You and I are the carriers of the message. You and I are the carriers of the message. Verse 19 says, God has committed this ministry to 
us. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we are called to represent him and deliver his message to people just like any good ambassador would do in this earth. Church, I believe the Holy Spirit is focusing, is spotlighting this issue for us in our day. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to know that if we do not do this work, it will never get done because God has committed it to the body of Christ. Angels have not been commissioned to preach the gospel, nor is it the government's job to share the faith of Christ. Neither did God say that this is something for the pastors to do. That doesn't mean that the pastors don't share Christ. But we're here primarily to equip you. As I look at this room, I know that you represent thousands of people that you're going to touch this week that, that I could never touch. God doesn't even say that he gave this ministry to the evangelists. And obviously evangelists are called to share the gospel. That's what they do. But I want to help you here with something that confuses a lot of people. Sometimes people say, well, I don't really preach my faith too much or witness too much for Jesus because I'm not an evangelist. Because I don't have the gift of evangelism. Well, maybe you're not an evangelist and maybe you, you don't have an evangelistic grace on your life, you don't think, but, but every Christian has the role of evangelizing. And that's a different matter. We can all share Jesus, every one of us, each in his own style, his own way. And we can all learn to do it better for sure, but we do need to do it. We're his ambassadors, and it's up to us to share the news about our king. You know, there's been a strange trend lately in the church of Christians who don't witness for Christ. And this is a supposedly spiritual thing. Maybe you've heard some people say, well, I just want to show people Jesus by the way I live. There's a little saying you might have heard that says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. <laughs> that may sound spiritual, but it's not good doctrine. And if you have that on your bumper sticker, I'm sorry, but I'll, <laughs> but I'll give you a razor blade after the service. <laughs> because you see, my Bible says that people are born again by what? By the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Not by looking at my fallible life or yours. No offense. <laughs> Paul asks us in Romans 10, how can people hear if there's no one to tell them, if there's no preacher? I understand the quiet approach, believe me. And sure, there are some people out there we know and love who have represented the Lord in a manner that maybe makes us uncomfortable. Maybe you have that friend who only owns two t-shirts, you know, the one that says get right or get left, and the other one says turn or burn. <laughs> maybe you have that friend. A church, don't misunderstand me. How we live in front of people matters matters a great deal, and our speech should always be gracious. But we need to never forget the gospel is a message. It has content. There is a content to the gospel, and it must be shared. We need to talk with people about Jesus and what he's done for them. We are the only carriers of this message. All right, now the final thing the Holy Spirit wants us to know about the ministry of reconciliation is this. And worship team, you can return, please. <clears throat> the final thing we need to know about the ministry of reconciliation is that it's critical that we share the message. It's critical that we share the message. Church, it's time for us to feel again the urgency of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is not indifferent about whether people hear the message of his love. I don't think you got that. God is not indifferent about whether people hear about his love, and neither should we be. It's time that once again, we allow the love of God to compel us to share his love with somebody before it's too late. Many times you've probably heard people say that the church is like a hospital. 
But I think the church is only a good hospital if it has a big maternity ward. And here's what I believe the Holy Spirit saying. I believe that Christians in America need to focus again on something very simple. Winning people to Jesus. We're not here to put a band-aid on the lost. We're here to be midwives for Jesus, capable of leading people into the new birth because Jesus said, ye must be born again. But let's be honest today with ourselves. When was the last time that I shared God's message of reconciliation with somebody? Maybe it's been a little bit longer than we'd like to admit. That's okay. You know that Jesus said we can repent and do the first works. We can do the works that we once did for him. And maybe some of us have become a little bit worried lately about where the country is headed. Well, let me tell you a little secret. There's nothing wrong with America that 50 million new people getting saved wouldn't fix. Are you concerned when you see people rise up with hatred against Christ and against his church? Let's remember that we have received a ministry from God, the ministry of reconciliation, and we have been appointed and empowered by God to help him turn sinners into saints, just like somebody shared Jesus with you and your life was transformed. I hope you don't feel guilty about this little push that I'm giving everybody this morning, but let's take this word as a loving nudge from the Holy Spirit to get up and be about Father's business. Church, we need to see again that the need is urgent. All around us, people are dying, and the Holy Spirit is pleading with them to come to God's mercy seat. We feel what he feels for them. Listen to what Paul says in verse 20. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, meaning we beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Look at the strength of those words. Imagine as though God were pleading through us. We beg you. Feel the urgency of the Spirit. Be reconciled to God, we beg you. And church, don't be afraid to share Jesus with people. The Lord is with us. Paul says, we are workers together with him. Everybody say, God is with me. It feels pretty good, right? Don't be intimidated. God will help you to share his word. Be bold. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, because we are Christ's ambassadors, his priorities must be our priorities. And Jesus said his priority was to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. And let's share that this week. I want to give you some homework. I can do that. You know when you're in the pulpit that you can give people homework? It's not in the Bible. It's in somewhere. I don't know. It's in the, the first book of additions, I think. But I'm going to give you some homework this week. It's very simple homework, easy to remember. You won't even have to write it down to remember what I'm asking you to do. Can we share Jesus with at least one person this week? God to make some opportunities for you to share Jesus and then ask God for the boldness to speak up and share Jesus with a friend, with a co-worker, with a neighbor, with a relative. Let's tell people that pardon can be theirs and tell them that God is saying to them today is the day of salvation. Church, if you listen to your heart, then maybe you can sense the Lord's return drawing closer every day. 
And if that's your heart, let's decide that when Jesus comes, he will find that we have been faithful ambassadors for Christ. Reach out for the first time, or maybe reach out for the first time in a long time and tell somebody, share the message of a dying Savior's love for them. Our mission, our great pressing duty as believers is to share the message of reconciliation because the great and pressing need of every man is to be reconciled to God. Come on, let's stand and let's give Jesus a praise in his house this morning. Come on, somebody bless the Lord in this house.